Patrick, um, you are live now, so welcome to the stream. It's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, I'm getting some signals from people in the chat that they can hear you. And they're ex oh, okay. extremely enthusiastic. Can you also see the chat, by the way? Otherwise, I will read it to you. Uh, no, I can't. No. Okay. Yeah. No, that's probably for the best because otherwise says you, can, you can actually follow it on YouTube if you want and see it yourself. But uh, I suppose the most smooth course of action is for me to help you out during some points in our conversation and uh, read out the nicest and most interesting questions. How, how does that sound? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, then let me introduce you quickly, although I think it probably won't be necessary given that your channel is uh, quite a bit bigger than mine and also that I always see in my statistics that people watch your channel a lot as well. But for those who, who have you know been living under a rock, this uh, is uh, Patrick Boyle here with me, who is, uh, I think, a finance professional, still a hedge fund manager and also a professor. Um, yeah, I, I no longer run business but yeah oh okay all right all right an ex, ex hand, hedge fund manager <laughs> patrick yeah to start i just wanted to you know ask you basically as one educator who um, came to youtube to another why uh, what uh, what happened why are we uh, looking at you every week uh, these days well it's funny my, my channel kind of started out as a way you know, in, at the university, I just sort of was able to, I, I was teaching a financial derivatives class. And as the exams approached, the students would ask me all of these questions, you know, can you explain this thing again? And I thought, well, it'd be easier if I just recorded it and provided them with links. And so it kind of started out as really just a, a tiny thing for, for my students at the university. And then, uh, you know, when the pandemic struck, it just seemed the world got really interested in finance. And my channel changed quite a bit just because there was sort of one event where back when the price of oil went negative and the whole world was sort of filled with confusion as to, you know, why did this happen? And, you know, when you teach a derivatives class, it's kind of a, it's a, a really interesting uh, example for your students. So I put up a video explaining why oil prices went negative. Mm -hmm. And before that, like all of my videos got sort of 200 views from my students. And suddenly that one got maybe 20,000 views. And in a way that was almost the, the start of, you know, what is today my YouTube channel, which is just looking at kind of interesting things that are happening in markets and trying to understand them. So, yeah. So uh, you basically did the old uh, YouTuber formula, like um, if something works, do do more of that. Yeah, yeah, you know, you you end up uh, working for the algorithm. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I can definitely recognize that. So I actually did, did had a similar yeah you know, experience in the sense that a lot of my earlier videos were more like lectures, and then I just found that there's this um, you know need for people to understand what's happening around us today through the lens of, in your case, I guess, finance and in my case, economics. Yeah. And actually it, it's a funny thing because for the longest time, like when I, when I first discovered YouTube, like back, I don't know, like 2006 or something like that. Uh, you know, if you remember early YouTube, all the, it was kind of more like TikTok where it was all short videos of like a cat falling down the stairs or something like it wasn't, it wasn't great. And I remember coming across a, a channel by a guy named Justin Sanderco who teaches guitar. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, you know, because I was trying to learn the guitar and suddenly I had this amazing instructor on YouTube teaching like everything I wanted to know. And I thought, wow, this is sort of an amazing platform. But I didn't necessarily ever picture myself putting content up. I, I was kind of a consumer of it. But I've always thought of YouTube as a really interesting and useful educational platform, you know, because there's just quite cool that the, I, I guess even that's just what's cool about the internet in general is the the fact that you have sort of so much knowledge at your fingertips. It's it's amazing, you know, and so it's it's kind of cool to be able to contribute a little bit to that as well. Yeah, and uh, given that your channel is is doing so well, did this also impact sort of other parts of your career? Have you started teaching less, or um, is that that why you're no longer a hedge fund manager? Or no, it's actually well, partially even when I I started doing the YouTube thing, I I, I business and I I sold it, and uh, it was really sort of after selling the fund business, 
that I started doing this and I was kind of focused on uh, initially on writing and things like that. You know, I wrote a, a couple of textbooks and that kind of thing. And, um, t- uh, you know, YouTube hasn't really affected my life that much in that I, I think twice I've, I've run into someone out in the public who's sort of seen my, my channel. It, it's kind of, it's a very interesting thing because you sort of sit in an office and you reach out to, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, but it's a, it's an interesting kind of connected yet disconnected thing that, that sort of happens, you know. Yeah, that does make sense. And But what about the, the time commitment, for example? Because, you know, I think uh, YouTube has absolutely consumed my my everyday uh, life. And um, I was talking to you yesterday quickly and you were very busy researching. So how, how is that part um, going for you? Well, that, that's kind of interesting, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's changed my life too much just because that's always what I've done. You know, like it's mm. kind of, for me, I've, since I sort of discovered financial markets, I've been kind of fascinated by them and just trying to work out what's going on. And I guess the big difference now is that I sort of share what I've worked out with with an audience while before, uh, you know, I, I didn't really do that. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I actually really enjoy sort of digging into things and just trying to understand them. And that's even, you know, I, I think for someone who wants to have a career in financial markets, if you find yourself fascinated by that sort of thing, it's probably a good idea. And if, if you're not interested in it, well, there's there's probably not much of a way to change that, you know, like it's, uh, I don't know, either something that fascinates you or it doesn't. So Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that you, you also recognize this in your videos. So I, I, what I always really like about them is sort of how in detail you go compared to other YouTube channels. So for example, I think especially you did a lot of reporting on the China crisis last year. And the, the detail you go into is, it's much more detailed. Like for example, uh, remember you uh, reporting on Evergrande and every and and all sorts of companies that were connected to them. Whereas a typical YouTuber, in my experience, would maybe stop at you know Evergrande. I think that's also why people really appreciate you, at least partially. Uh, do you recognize that? Yeah, I, I guess it's just that uh, for myself, I want the full picture, and then then when I explain it to someone, I want to explain what I've learned. But I, actually, even a a thing I noticed a little bit over the last year or two is even if, if someone has a question, like if someone wants the story of Evergrande explained to them and they don't know much about China or emerging markets or the real estate business or all of these sort of interlocking stories that come together as Evergrande, if you try and dig through the press to understand it, all of the information will be there, but it will be really fragmented, you know, because a journalist will might write like 12 pieces on a given topic, but they they don't ever then bring it all together into sort of a, a start to finish story. And in a mm-hmm. way, I think almost the, the thing that's interesting to do on YouTube is to so, sort of explain the full picture rather than uh, you know, sort of 20 fragments of the picture that can then, you know, if, if someone really wants the, to put the work into it, they can assemble the jigsaw puzzle. But it's, it's maybe, at least for me, fun to, to put the jigsaw puzzle together and explain it to people. So I think that that's something that uh, the people over at uh, Vox, V-O-X, uh, also talk about a lot. So they say like there's uh, this explaining the news sort of kind of trend, which is different from traditional journalism in the sense that you tell them all sorts of background story as well, because like a newspaper just reports and sort of assumes that you're already up to date on everything. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I I think to a reasonable extent, newspapers are kind of amongst the best places to go for information, but they are on a daily news cycle. So they're, they're going to tell you what changed the story today rather than bring you up to date, like kind of say, we'll go back 30 years to uh, China joined the WTO. <laughs> How this turned into a real estate bubble, which, which then collapsed, you know. And so, uh, you know, I, I fully understand that they're just doing kind of a different thing. And then a lot of the the really good journalists, you know, they'll, um, many of them will then 
if they've covered a story and covered it really well, they'll turn it into a book, which is, of course, great. But even the, the speed of the public, publication cycle for books can be quite slow. So it, it can be sort of, a, you know, we'll, we'll say like when uh, the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme collapsed, it was kind of, I don't know, it was two, three years later before really good books on that topic came out just because it, it takes that long to, I guess, research and, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, get everything through the, the publishing houses. So, yeah. And nowadays people just have to wait a week for, for the Patrick Will video on that. Um, Patrick, uh, I think we need to get into, um, what we were supposed to talk about today. I wanted to talk to you about sort of what I coined the everything crisis, in the sense that uh, we're living through such turbulent times, which is a bit of a cliche because people always say it. But then again, if I look back uh, sort of as an economist, you know, we had this massive pandemic. Now we have inflation that we hadn't seen before, uh, geopolitical turmoil that we haven't seen uh, perhaps since since the, the end of the Cold War, especially not when it comes to sort of the size of sanctions and what it's doing to gas prices, then also one of your favorite industries, crypto, uh, is collapsing. So uh, what's your take on all of this? Because typically you report, but I would also, you know, want to to know sort of your own opinion on, on this kind of stuff. Are you scared? Well, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. Like there are, it's funny because I think there's always, uh, as you mentioned, sort of always crises in markets, you know, like I, I sort of started... Um, in finance in the late 90s and there was the bubble and boom of the dot-com stocks and then we had September 11th and then we had the build-up to the credit crunch and that collapse and so you know there's always drama in the world I, I guess that's just the way uh, the, the way humanity is but it, you know I do agree with you that there seem to be a lot of things coming together right now to, to a certain extent I wonder if it's just that markets and everything have become more globalized. And so you just see higher correlation between markets because we'll say historically, individual countries might have economies that were much, uh, much more distant from each other. While right now, even you see as the United States starts hiking interest rates, you see impacts in emerging markets and so on. And I think the world is maybe just more interconnected. So there's maybe fewer places to hide than there were in the past. Like maybe, you know, 20 years ago, if if one market was struggling, you could go to another. And to a certain extent, the, the crypto people were making the argument that, that Bitcoin or, you know, various crypto coins were an entirely separate ecosystem in which We'll say, for example, like the Bitcoiners for a while talked about it as a, a hedge for inflation because they felt inflation related to money printing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the inflation kicks in and crypto gets destroyed. You know, I, I think we're just really seeing that uh, maybe markets are becoming more risk on risk off and just just a much higher correlation to each other. And and that also means that. Um, investors struggle to get the same benefit from diversification that they used to in the past. Yeah. yeah and do you, do you also see this across markets? So I definitely agree that I see it um, across countries. We economists even have like a, an official term for this, which is the global financial cycle, uh, meaning that sort of countries are, are much more correlated and also react much more strongly to monetary policy decisions. So hiking or, or lowering interest rates in the United States. But do you also see it across markets? So uh, was this different in the dot-com? I think at, at that time, the housing market didn't seem to be that much affected by the stock market, for example. Well, it's, it's interesting. The, the, you know, I, I'm slightly fascinated by the overlaps between the, the dot-com bubble and the, the recent market conditions. Because for a long time, I, I argued that things weren't as bubbly a year or two ago as they were in the late 90s, because there's almost, uh, you know, when, when you look at the valuation some companies had in 1999, like it was absolutely insane. And, and markets were very different back then in that companies used to IPO in order to raise capital. You know, now they raise capital in private markets and they IPO at multi-billion dollar valuations, while 
in 1999, you would see these dot-com startups that were sort of three guys in a rented office, two months later IPOing for, for uh, you know, on, on the NASDAQ for, for a significant chunk of change. The stock market didn't get as overdone this time around, but it would appear to me that maybe that was because things like crypto took in so much of the froth, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of the arguments that I hear from young people who invest in crypto are the exact same arguments that young people were making in, in the late 1990s about the dot-com startups. So I slightly wonder if the reason things are a little bit less frothy in the stock market six months ago, simply because the place where the, the kind of crazy money was going was crypto rather than the stock market. There were, there were just different places for people to go with their, with their money. So Yeah, so I can relate. I, I have a, a question for you about crypto because so many people ask me to ask you about crypto. So, so we'll get to that. But for that, I was wondering, you know, so I always try to, re I'm looking at the same things, of course, in, in the markets as well, but from an economist perspective, and I always try to relate it to, this theory by Robert Schiller, I think you, you may know, um, yeah. but sort of he's like from the behavioral finance space. And what he often says is like there, if there's irrational exuberance, so if basically like the point, like if your neighbor is giving you, you like Patrick Boyle an ex hedge fund manager stock tips, then, then you're in a bubble. And no, I was maybe a little bit too young at the time, but I, I heard stories that this was the case during the dot-com bubble. Uh, this was definitely the case, crypto 2017. Then I made a video about crypto early in their cycle, this cycle, and, and I thought it wasn't the case. But, you know, now I use the barometer of how much spam comments I get about investing in crypto to get an idea of where we are in, in that bubble cycle of irrational exuberance. Do you also relate yeah, to, to that? Well, yeah, it's it's an it's an interesting idea. The funny thing with the spam comments, because I get them on my channel too, and I'm always trying to get rid of them. But it made me laugh like even kind of two weeks ago when I don't know, Bitcoin was down like fifty or sixty percent on the year. You'd have these, uh, you know, the you know the way they put these sort of fake conversations within the the chat under your videos, and there'd be these chats kind of going, "Crypto is definitely the best place to make money right now." And you're looking at, it and you're like, "Wow, like they really, like they don't even care. <laughs> like they're just using the same conversation, even though the the entire thing has collapsed." Um, mm, yeah, it's interesting. I I do think there is a thing of of people getting really drawn into the markets at at certain points and there's actually there's there's a book that i i really enjoy that's called market sense and nonsense by jack schwager and all of those market wizards books and that sort of thing but this book is is kind of a really interesting one in that he kind of unpicks a few ideas around the efficient markets hypothesis but there's you know, how, how do you know that things are getting frothy? It's, it's always, gosh, it, it's kind of hard to tell because things always change. And I, I worry as well that if you were to kind of take the sort of shoeshine boy example, you know, I think the famous story from that, it might be in, um, it might have been Jesse Livermore, one of these guys who got a stock tip from a shoeshine boy and kind of decided that the, the market had peaked in 1929. And that's sort of gone down in, in market lore. But the, the problem with that is, is that possibly you're always too early. There's the, the opposite argument to that is George Soros's argument, which is that, uh, you know, he, he sort of feels that these things um, kind of cycle up and cycle down. And he says that the should pop to it because as the potential of expanding and expanding. And then the trick is to, is to get out before it bursts, you know, but, but he doesn't advocate reversing uh, psychology. He, he advocates almost kind of joining in, but being aware that, uh, that, that things are not normal. So. so does this also relate to, to what you teach as a finance uh, professor, like efficient market hypothesis, but then all the deviations from it? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's a funny thing because I never love when people kind of come out and sort of say the, the efficient market hypothesis is rubbish because it's not. And I think it really is, is a good rule of thumb for most investors, especially if you're kind of planning on, um, you know, just sort of 
spending a, a few hours a week on your investment portfolio. It's probably a good approach just to think of things as efficient. But the truth is, at least the really hard view of the efficient markets hypothesis doesn't necessarily stand up to a ton of scrutiny in, in that we, we can find all sorts of things that are unusual and that are sort of, what, what can I say, like sort of special cases where they don't make sense within that context. One, one of the earlier ones that was, because I graduated university very much with that EMH point of view. Mm-hmm. And I remember in, in the late 90s, there was, um, no one will remember this device, it was before the BlackBerry, there was, there was a, a device you could buy called a Palm Pilot. Do you know what that is at all? Or? Was it like it, the, with the, 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 um, the stylus? Exactly. It was kind of the first handheld computer. And there, there were in true terrible things, but the world got very excited about them. It was kind of pre-Blackberry smartphone kind of thing, but without a phone. And, um, but the, the, it, the company, uh, Palm Pilot, was owned by a larger uh, business called 3Com. And 3Com spun off a big chunk of Palm, maybe 40% of it or something like that, as a, a separate traded company. Or no, maybe they spun off 60% and held 40%. I forget exactly. But the value of Palm exploded like it was one of those really hot stocks in the late 1990s while 3Com sort of languished and if you looked at it you you know if you bought 3Com you were buying Palm at maybe like a quarter of its actual price and so the funny thing was that you know you you might think like if if you were a, an advocate of the efficient markets hypothesis you might say well this is a quirky thing that happened on the side with a tiny little stock but this was something that was all over the newspapers. Like I bet there were a dozen articles in the Wall Street Journal about the puzzle of, of you know, why is Palm doing this? And, and throughout my career, you know, you just see hundreds of examples like this. Like even we'll say, for example, the, the meme stock thing, like in a, in a truly efficient market, like in sort of any version of EMH, that wouldn't happen. And so there, there are enough examples to say that things are not perfectly priced in, in markets. And even a, a while ago, a friend pointed out to me a, a, a rather interesting hole in EMH is just even the idea that if, if every asset was perfectly priced within markets, there wouldn't be an insurance business, for example, because whenever you buy insurance, you're you're overpaying for an asset like in order to feel better about, you know, in order to reduce your risk or whatever. But it's not something that should necessarily exist in a purely efficient market. So I think that markets are mostly efficient. I think for most investors, it's probably reasonable to spend your time doing what you do for work in order to earn money and then invest in like passive indexes or whatever. But the the pure idea of the efficient market hypothesis doesn't really hold up to an awful lot of examination, or at least not that sort of really perfect view of EMH. Yeah. And you also mentioned like the the hard view, like, well, but with, with your example, I wonder if economists wouldn't then come up to you and say, but okay, but this is uh, different risk preferences for um, investors. Uh, so it is still efficient to have uh, that some risk averse investors want some insurance. What do you think of that? Would would that be a, a counter argument? You know, it, it's a funny thing because I think we all understand like there's no confusion as to why people buy insurance, and actually there's not even confusion as to why people overpay for insurance. It's because you know essentially they're they're in a. We'll say for example, like if you buy a phone or something like that, and it's like a. $200 item and they charge you 50 bucks to insure it, you know, you would say, well, that's not a fair insurance premium. Why does anyone pay it? And it's like, well, the answer is that they're too lazy to, to look into other things. But, but, you know, the really hard version of EMH assumes that everything is perfectly priced, that all information is encapsulated and not just all public information, but even all private information is encapsulated in pricing. And that's not really the case. It, it just, you know, like I said, it, it, it probably doesn't, it doesn't justify everyone 
moving away and, and you know, becoming a, a trader for a living. But it does tell you that, um, you know, that, that there are opportunities out there for, for people who make kind of uh, cool-headed decisions. But of course, the problem is that we all think that we make cool-headed decisions, but we tend not to, so... And uh, actually, I, I I see now that we have a celebrity um, watching our live stream, Patrick, uh, in the chat. I see someone who you might know as the the famous YouTube giant uh, Richard Coffin from the Plain Bagel, asking you a question. Uh, yeah. On the topic of uh, emerge, uh, efficient market hypothesis, hypothesis, do you think markets have broadly become more efficient as access to markets has risen? Or have retail traders impaired price discovery? A GameStop type of question. <clears throat> well, that, that is a very interesting question. I, I think it's reasonable to expect things to get more efficient over time. But actually, you know, the last year and the whole meme stock, stock thing is actually just it really highlights a lack of, a, 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 well, gosh, are, are they adding? It's funny because even, um, you know, did did the the sort of short squeeze traders trade on a sensible decision? They kind of did in the, in that they understood there was a weakness in the market and they pushed on that weakness and and it provided a profit for them. But the the funny thing is that you have kind of two things in there because I think there's a handful of people, like a tiny number of people, who actually profited from that, like who got in early, saw the short squeeze was likely to happen, and, and maybe even got out when the short squeeze occurred. But to this day, there's a bunch of people who bought sort of 50% higher than many of those stocks are trading at right now. And, uh, you know, day by day, they're sort of waiting for the, the next short squeeze to come. So it's interesting, because I, I, I bet more money was lost by retail investors in that, uh, you know, in the meme stocks and was made by them, you know, and that that is sort of the the difficulty in uh, in trading is that uh, in particular, when people take a short term view is that it, it tends to be a, a sort of a zero sum game, less commissions. And so the, the middlemen do do very well out of um, such situations. And uh, it's difficult to, if, if you're arriving late to the party, firstly, no one ever realizes they're arriving late to the party. But, um, you know, the, those people end up often contributing more to the market than the ones who initially profited. So, so this is um, what I, why I really liked um, you joining, uh, joining the stream, uh, Patrick, in the sense that uh, I think our channels overlap um, quite a bit, right? In the sense that we are now having a very uh, economic, finance overlappy kind of uh, discussion about the efficient market hypothesis. So I was thinking before we move uh, to your favorite uh, asset class crypto, perhaps uh, we can take some questions. How, how do you uh, like that idea? Sounds good. Okay. Well, at least there are some opinions. So, so this is Patrick, something that I always like about these, uh, the chat as well, that people um, have conversations amongst each other that I'm then completely ob oblivious to. Um, but JP72 thinks that markets are getting more efficient because there's more efficient access to information. Um, sure, there may be more retail investors now, but plenty have moved to index funds, making markets less noisy. I, w I wouldn't really think of index fund investors as purely retail. Like, I think that's a good, if you are a retail investor, that's probably a decent approach. But I think at least in the current environment, when people talk about retail, I think they're generally talking about sort of, you know, individual accounts who are actively investing rather than, um, you know, sort of people who uh, dollar cost average into their, uh, into their uh, retirement accounts. But. Um, so another uh, question from Frederico who says, I wonder if Patrick knows anything about Elliott Waves uh, and what he thinks about it if, if he knows about it. Uh, I don't know who Elliott Waves is, but uh, perhaps you do. Well, e Elliott Waves are sort of a form of technical analysis. And uh, well, it's interesting because my career, like most of my trading has been based on, uh, you know, statistical analysis, basically looking at price moves and trying to find something predictive in them. And 
Elliott wave is a, a type of technical analysis. And so the early days of what I do, I, I kind of got every book on technical analysis and basically every book on anyone's market theories that I could find and tried to backtest them in order to work out kind of what works and what doesn't work in markets. And so it's, it's quite easy just to look at the big ideas out there and test them. Unfortunately, the problem with Elliott Wave is that it's entirely untestable. You know, if you speak to uh, kind of three or four different practitioners, they'll all tell you that the market is on a different wave or whatever. And so I'm not a fan of that approach. It, it slightly strikes me as pseudoscience, you know, where they take on all of these technical terms. But if you can't, if everyone can't, agree that, uh, you know, that that something is that the signal has occurred, it makes it impossible to test. And therefore, it's sort of an unfalsifiable hypothesis is, is the problem with that. And, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things within the technical analysis space that are very I, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's deliberate, but I, I think there's there's an awful lot of unfalsifiable hypotheses put forth. And to me, I think it's better because I'm someone who who tests things like my whole way of working is to hear a theory and then to dig through the data and see whether that makes sense or not. Uh, you know, I don't have an awful lot of interest in things that that sort of are vague and difficult to, to test. I've seen one other interesting question uh, I think uh, we can take or you can take uh, before we move on to the next, next subject. There are some also some economics questions. I would love to talk uh, to you about that as well, but I think we should answer them uh, You know, after we talked about that. Uh, but this is maybe already a little bit of a bridge. Someone was asking, do you think that central bank interventions have made markets less uh, efficient? So ultra low interest rates, uh, quantitative easing and all of that. Who agree that that maybe markets have become more fragile because of excess intervention, you know, because I I think in a way, losses teach us lessons or, or you know, sort of, um, what can I say, pain in markets teaches us lessons and we don't repeat our mistakes. And to a certain extent, over the years, uh, in particular in sort of developed markets, We've seen this thing where if things go wrong, you know, the Federal Reserve or, or something is, what can I say, the regulators kind of step in in order to, to calm things down and improve things. And, you know, you'll see these, uh, I don't know, even minor fluctuations in the market that the central bank get into a panic over and decide a rate cut is needed or whatever. And I worry that that makes investors excessively complacent, you know, like uh, I, I think to a certain extent, having to deal with the consequences of big events, like I, I'm one of the few people uh, in, in finance who thought that it was a good thing that Lehman Brothers went bust, because I think it was important that there be a lesson that there is a consequence toward to sort of ill thought out risk taking. And, and I think it's harmful. The, the too big to fail idea is, is dangerous in markets, in my opinion. Now, not everyone agrees with me on that. But. Well, I mean, uh, that brings us to a question that someone actually asked me on the post, uh, which I announced our conversation. And that is to please find uh, some, uh, something that we disagree about. And I think there we have it in the sense that I do agree with you that it's pretty uh, ridiculous to to bail out an institution full of super wealthy people who, who just did stupid stuff. But as a central banker, for example, I made this big video on Japan. I do understand why they bail out banks. I don't think it's, it's I think it's something we want to get rid of, but we have sort of outsourced the whole monetary system to private banks. And if they collapse and they take each other with them, then we don't, we no longer have a monetary system. And so I do also uh, understand why you would, would bail out banks, even though I would hope that you, you can well, find you, ways you around would that. Maybe, and, and I imagine that many lessons have been learned from uh, the financial crisis. And I would hope that the idea going forward would be that, because I think pre the financial crisis, 
I, I'm not really sure that central bankers thought it would happen and thus they they maybe didn't fully have a plan as to how to implement things. And and it very much at the time felt like things were thrown together over a weekend, which I think they probably were. Mm-hmm. But maybe in, in the longer run, uh, a, a better idea is like if if bailouts have to occur, that that they would maybe have to occur in, uh, or that they should occur in a way that that uh, so that the people who made the mistakes didn't walk away with large bonuses and whatever. Because um, I, I think that's really more the injustice that occurred. But e- even if we mm. step away from the too big to fail thing, I I worry that maybe smoothing the path too much for investors allows them uh, and maybe encourages them to behave in a manner where they believe that they'll always be bailed out. Like e- even the the current thing, um, when we look at, a, there's a lot of investors who piled into the markets in 2020 during, uh, you know, towards the start of the COVID pandemic. And really all they saw was this huge rush upwards, the sort of stonks only go up kind of meme. And um, the thing is that, that 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 is not the way the world works. And in a way, it's it's good to be through a, a few cycles of financial markets to understand how things can go wrong. And, and therefore, it's important maybe that things occasionally go wrong in order to sort of strengthen uh, the, the, the I, I think it's probably makes markets more stable if in a funny way, if they're allowed to be a little bit less stable. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we can definitely uh, sort of maybe find a middle ground on, on this in the sense that I, I always get the impression that it's very much, even though we, we like to discuss about the sort of the, the, the big actions, like to bail out a bank or not to bail out a bank, I think it very often really boils down to how you bail out a bank in the sense that, you know, if I were to say, hey, Patrick, the, the three biggest European banks are about to implode, let's bail them out, but uh, let's nationalize them, uh, let's treat them as a utility from here on out, and let's fire the people uh, sort of uh, who were in charge. Then we might, uh, then you might might say, well, let me know. Uh, oh, okay, fair enough. Like Like that, we can yeah. do it, right? Well, well, it's it's even it's an interesting concept because sort of over the financial crisis, there was almost this idea that bondholders could never lose. And of course, there is a credit spread on bonds that relates, you know, you are being paid when you when you invest in a bond, you're being paid a credit spread because you're taking on risk. And well, a good example would be even the the way the crisis occurred in, in Ireland, where there was this idea that we couldn't possibly allow bondholders to ever lose. And it's like, well, that's, th- then they're all government bonds, you know, then they all should be priced as government bonds if that's how they're to be treated. While it, it becomes mm-hmm. an interesting thing where people sort of invest in a risky security. And then when things go wrong, they kind of go, oh, but I, I shouldn't be exposed to this risk. I shouldn't be exposed to losses, you know, so. Yeah. No, and I guess we're getting sort of into the territory where people will say, well, there's like corporate socialism. And and that's, I think, also definitely a bad thing in the sense that like these these, these very wealthy people do get bailed out. And then uh, at the bottom, you know, they much more often don't. But I think we should uh, definitely make both of us should, should maybe make some more videos about that, because I think there's there's a lot there. But I did have another question uh, from from a supporter. Uh, who says, what do you think uh, about the current level of corporate debt and uh, what role that might play in, in future crises? Fortunately, without doing uh, some research, I don't really have a good, I don't have a good answer to that. Unfortunately, I'd, I'd just be making something up if I gave you an answer. So. I think I think that's fair enough. What I do know is that, that sort of all debt is at, at record high levels. And I think that is something that is worrying uh, many economists and maybe ma- would make this crisis moment more dangerous than um, the 2001 moment, for example, more similar to, to the 2007 moment. Um, so household debt is, is once again at record levels. I think in many countries, corporate debt is as well. Government debt is also super high. Yeah. So uh, if I can answer that question then uh, then for you, uh, I think that w- that might make a future crisis uh, much more risky. Okay. 
Okay, I think we should also talk maybe macroeconomics. I'm not sure how long you, you still have. Um, I'm, I'm fine, yeah. All right, okay, then uh, let's keep going. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to get a quick your quick thoughts on uh, the crypto space because you, you do come across as a, a bit of a skeptic. And um, I think you also mentioned to me at some point that... Um, if you do crypto videos, uh, you get the most uh, the most lovely hate comments. Uh, so um, yeah, so so what is your view on crypto? Well, I actually just find it fascinating. You know, I've I've I think the thing that interests me the most about crypto is just that it's opened a conversation as to what does money even mean. You know, and and that's kind of a a question I've found myself pursuing on my channel like there's there's all sorts of interesting things you know i made a video about john law the um you know the the sort of uh, i don't know if you come the inventor of paper money and and also the mississippi company um he's kind of a a fascinating person but it's a very interesting thing to look at the world when it went from this idea of using gold coin or gold, precious metals to using um paper money and it's fascinating in that the the problem europe had quite a problem at the time at least england france many of the countries had this problem of there not being enough coin to go around and so essentially commerce was grinding to a halt because there wasn't a good means of exchange and so john law came up with a bunch of different ideas uh, eventually settling on um on at first uh, kind of gold-backed paper currency in France. And when this money became available, there was a huge economic boom in France. And by that, I don't mean like people spending money on frivolous things, but like big engineering projects, bridges, all sorts of things were built because there was a means for people to both, you know, to, to sort of save your work, which is kind of what money does. It allows you to to work today, but to to um, sort of store the benefit of that work for another point in time. And so it's interesting that when people have an ability to do that, they tend to be more productive. So we had this huge burst in productivity in France. But then, of course, uh, we, we kind of ran into rather quickly because it was all new. There was sort of, you know, the excessive speculation, uh, too much money was printed and, and it all went to zero. But it was a fascinating time in history and an interesting experiment. So that's one thought on money. We equally then can look at things like the wildcat banking era in the United States, where there were all sorts of private currencies. And actually, the idea of private currencies has been around for an awfully long time. Yeah. And seems to kind of work. Like it's it, it it's what's interesting about this stuff is is that it it all to a certain extent depends on on faith and on trust. And the the final example that that sort of fascinates me that I tie into crypto is in in the, the I think it was in 1970 in Ireland for about a year and a half all of the banks shut down. They all went on strike. So the country was running with no banking system whatsoever. And so that any economist would look at this and kind of think, well, the entire nation, the entire economic sim system will, will collapse in a, a couple of weeks. While instead, for over a year, things not only did they kind of go along as normal, but the economy actually grew. And it was largely because the, the local pubs just took people's checks and so on. And you know, mm. the publican knew his customers and he knew kind of who was good credit and who was bad credit. And basically everyone dealt with each other on a system of credit that seemed to kind of work. Um, and in fact, there were no hiccups. And, and it amused me because I discovered this story, I don't know, maybe about a year ago. Yeah. And I spoke to some older relatives of mine in Ireland. And I said, you know, this interesting thing happened in Ireland. Like, what are your memories of it? And they were like, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's a thing that happened. Like, none of them even thought it was interesting or unusual, even though this kind of wild experiment <laughs> had occurred. But everything just got by. And what interested me as a comparison with the world of crypto was that in crypto, the idea is to search for sort of trustless systems, while at least in that example, a very trust-based system was kind of how 
Mm. society and the overall economy manage to move ahead. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm anti-crypto. I'm, I'm interested in it and I find it kind of a, a puzzle and I find that there's a huge history of very similar things, you know, that, that occurred throughout history. Even the proof of work idea of crypto slightly uh, fascinates me because um, now I'm uh, not able to remember the name, but the the polished uh, seashell beads, uh, what was it mm. called? Um, oh, yeah. The Native yeah. Americans used them. I forget there's a name for it. Um, someone will tell us in the comments. Yeah. But, but basically, that's a form of proof of work in that seashells are common, but it would take a Native American craftsman maybe half a day to carve and polish uh, one bead. And so then people used these beads as money and it was and and they actually did have a scarcity because there was this huge amount of work involved in making them so there's many ideas in crypto that that possibly look newer than they are or at least you can find interesting historic examples that relate to them and so unfortunately i don't see an awful lot of use in crypto like when i look at a lot of history we'll say just the idea of private currencies private currencies usually fit in in places where there was a big flaw in um in standard currency so we'll mm, say for yeah. example in the united states uh, there were no small denomination notes like the smallest uh when the dollars first came out the smallest uh unit of currency i think was I forget whether it was a one or a five dollar bill, but but essentially it would have related to about a week or two weeks work for for a tradesman, you know. And so all of these private currencies appeared as a means to pe for people to buy a newspaper or a loaf of bread and that kind of thing. While you know when people say, "Oh, we need an an electronic form of payment on the internet," and it's like, well, you know, the Visa network <laughs> exists and and. You know, I, I appreciate, I, I too am frustrated with the, often the high cost of the banking system. But it, it would appear to me that often, you know, having run an investment fund, I'm aware that like it's very frustrating, we'll say, if you want to convert money from one currency into another, how expensive it can be, especially from a retail perspective. But the, the reason it is that expensive relates often more to regulation than it does to profiteering from the banks, because the banks aren't that profitable. When, when you look at like the huge spreads on foreign exchange, the banks aren't actually that profitable. And it, it's the truth is that they have to do a ton of paperwork when they take on, yeah. when they onboard a client and maybe move a couple of hundred thousand dollars into another currency and they have to check that, uh, you know, all sorts of money laundering and tax rules are being followed. And, and the reason that a lot of kind of fintech or crypto stuff appears to be, well, and is cheaper, is simply that they are sidestepping a lot of that regulation that banks are not allowed to sidestep. So, yeah. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack there, uh, Patrick. Uh, first of all, I, I think it would be you. You might actually find it very interesting to to hear about it, like a couple of much older examples of uh, of paper money. I think um, the the Chinese were the first ones to even to to have paper money. And what I also found fascinating is that when I studied um, ancient Greece a little bit in one of my earliest videos, that they had a lot of deposit money already before paper money, in the sense that that this was just in a ledger written down. You had to actually go to the bank and and with someone else, and they would uh, make the transaction for you in a in a centralized ledger a, a very long time ago uh, already. But uh, I, I agree with you that this is also what drew me to crypto. This is uh, why I had some crypto guests on as well, never to talk about how rich you can get with crypto, because you know. I think most of that is a scam, but uh, I'm, I really find it interesting some of the experiments that they are doing with trying to create private currencies. But also, like you mentioned, it, you just don't see that much of it uh, being used for real economic activity. You see a lot of these stable coins being used to, to gamble more in financial markets, but not that many to actually buy stuff. Uh, and that's well, a shame. You know, the, the problem is that if the entire advantage that they have which is sort of 
uh, theoretically lower transaction costs. That comes from being sort of outside the law, like from not being regulated. Yeah. And who is going to run a business that's outside the law? That The answer, unfortunately, seems to be outlaws, you know. <laughs> and the, you know, a good example, like to compare it to a regular business, you could say, why is it cheaper to stay at an Airbnb than it is to stay at a hotel? And the answer is that hotels have all sorts of regulations that they have to comply to and Airbnbs don't. And so once again, you end up maybe with a non-level playing field between the two. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it sort of, it, it is what it is. But it, in, the other thing actually that fascinates me a little bit about crypto, and it just ties into concepts around financial regulation, is that I'm often amazed, you know, people will lose some money, we'll say, in some crypto scam. And they'll they'll kind of rail online and say, like, why is the SEC doing nothing to protect my stolen monkey JPEGs, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the funny thing, I, I think there's an interesting thing that we all uh, fall foul of, maybe, is the idea that, that, and it's back even to the idea of sort of too big to fail ideas and so on, is that most of us, when we live within a regulated financial system, we kind of believe that there are protections there in place for us that are actually only in place for us in the regulated financial system. And so, for example, if, if you know, the, the, and there is, of course, then this cost to regulation, but a lot of people often... I, I think that people don't understand the risk difference between, you know, when they move outside of that system. And it's even, you know, a good example is even a, uh, like pre the whole crypto thing, you would see this in the area of like private investments in companies where people didn't necessarily understand that there's a there's a big difference between the audited statements that you'll see from uh, from an exchange listed company and the kind of financial statements you might get from the friend of yours who has a startup company that you've put money into, and I think that that there's it's an interesting thing because to a certain extent you could argue the regulators are somewhat to blame in in that or at least regulated financial systems make people think that they are safe and and that that uh, that financial markets are safe mm -hmm. and then they go out into the the wilds of crypto or, or private investments and find themselves being eaten alive and they're like well where did all of these sharks come from and it's like well you're you're in the deep sea now you're no longer in the the little pond you you used to be in and so that's also a fascinating thing to me about crypto is just almost a confusion that people have like they they sort of say well, isn't it illegal for Elon Musk to pump Dogecoin? And it's like, well, not really. Like, it's just, a, you know, it's not a, it's not a security. It's not even a defined thing. Um, you know, the the day might come when uh, you know some regulation exists around that. But at the moment, you know, even a, it's even interesting right now that the SEC are um, prosecuting people for insider trading in, in the crypto space because. It it doesn't. It's not obvious that that a lot of that stuff fits within the existing regulatory framework. Like in many ways, you could argue that a lot of crypto is sort of like buying stuff on eBay rather than uh, you know investing in a, a stock or a bond. And and have I'm not sure if I if I can ask you this question uh, because um, you're a finance professional. But have you swum in the deep sea yourself? I don't invest in any crypto simply th there's a list of reasons why one is that is that that I I don't feel I know an awful lot about it like I don't know enough about it I tend to like really deep liquid markets cuz you know my my main trading is in financial futures and I I have a good system for for investing that I've used for over 20 years. And since, since I, I, I no longer own the fund that I started, but I still run the investment strategy, but mm. with my own money. And 
and that works for me. And so to a certain extent, I kind of, <clears throat> you know, it makes sense to me to do what I know rather than to sort of step out into, into another thing. But I also, um, I even feel that there's many risks, there's, there's reputation risks also associated with crypto that I, I, I don't think people are really talking about very much right now. But uh, for for example, there's there's a guy I know who um, you know ended up in discussion with regulators uh, relating to money laundering because of uh, his crypto trading, and the the problem with crypto trading is, of course, you don't know who you're dealing with, right? And so, in many ways, you might think of yourself as buying and selling crypto tokens. But if the other side of that transaction is a, is a money launderer, mm. just because you don't know uh, that you're aiding in, in money laundering doesn't mean that you're, you're not and doesn't mean that the regulators won't be upset about that. And so, you know, I, I worry that a, a lot of people could in the future find themselves in trouble over issues like that. And it, it just doesn't... It, it, I, I don't really see such opportunity for me in that space for it to be worthwhile me getting too involved, you know? So I, yeah. I kind of more view it as an interesting uh, puzzle and an example than I do something that I would get involved in. Can, can that also be tied to sort of the argument that a lot of uh, crypto enthusiasts make, like that the institutional big money is is about to start investing in crypto, but if it's not, a, if it's already too risky, from a legal perspective for, for you, then, then that surely would be the case for a bank or a hedge fund as well, right? Or, or do they have enough lawyers to, to get around that, do you think? You know, the thing is that there's always someone who'll do these things. Like even when something, you know, just because something's unethical doesn't mean people won't do it. And, and there are plenty of, of hedge funds who already invest. In, in fact, it was funny, uh, back when I launched my fund, the, one of the service providers that I was using told me that the majority of the funds, that was what it was in around 2011, he said to me that he was dealing with tons of crypto funds at the time, you know. So so that existed, uh, you know, more, more than 10 years ago. The thing is, the real question is at what point do, what can I say, like the really big respectable investors get into crypto like the the question is when will your mom own bitcoin and if if you can't picture that ever happening then then maybe it never goes fully mainstream because if if you think about it like when when we look at the distribution of wealth in most western society it tends to be stacked towards the baby boomer generation and it's not obvious to me that they have any urge to sort of step outside of the traditional financial system to get involved in a lot of these things. Yeah. All right. So no swimming in the deep sea for you. Uh, also not for me, by the way. Uh, I always thought, hey, this is a bubble. And um, I think you can make good money in a bubble, but um, it's not necessarily my field of expertise. And, and so I, I, I wouldn't get into that. And I think I heard you made a similar argument. But shall we uh, take some crypto questions and then um, move on to uh, to talk maybe a little bit about macroeconomics uh, and the markets? Uh, I think I even yep. had it in the thumbnail, boil and macro. So let me have a look at, uh, do you have some um, crypto related uh, questions uh, for us? Uh, also, Luke uh, asks, isn't it also problematic that crypto has no intrinsic value where it isn't tied to anything really? Uh, like the euro is tied to the euro zone market, giving it value. How does crypto obtain value? What do you think about you that? You know, once again, that that's one of the things that fascinates me because I could easily dismiss it in that way. And we could walk through a whole bunch of examples of why it's definitely worth nothing. Uh, you know, I ages ago, I saw a video that Nassim Tlaib put up where he kind of tried to build a discounted cash flow model of cryptocurrencies and obviously it came to zero because the cash flows were zero. but there's many other things that have no cash flows that seem to have value. And, and I made a video on this topic looking at collectibles and trying to relate them to cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. to, or at least the NFT space in crypto. But 
you know, for example, like rare stamps, like I would have no urge to own a rare stamp. Like I, I would get no joy out of having this thing in a, I don't know, a, a safe in my home. There must be someone who does because they spend fortunes on it or even artworks. There's, there's lots of things that have no intrinsic value. A, a good example would be even things like if you owned like the, the Fender Stratocaster that Jimi Hendrix had played, you know, that would be an item of huge value. But it, it's a value that's almost it's almost mm. like a religious relic, you know, that a yeah. saint has touched, you know, and and anyone who thinks really rationally would would say, well, that's a 1960s Stratocaster. It's worth the same as all other 1960s Stratocasters, but the world doesn't agree with you. So in, in a similar way, like I, I think once again, this is kind of what makes crypto interesting is that you can make all you can definitely make sort of hard level headed arguments that it's definitely worth nothing but equally you can find other things that have a long history of holding their value that should also be worth nothing you know you you could argue even we'll say antique furniture like couldn't a craftsman today bang out a whole bunch of perfect replicas yeah. uh, actually a, a friend of mine is a, a great violinist and he's played a number of uh, Stradivarius violins. And he said to me, they're not necessarily the best violins in the world. He says, they're all different. They're not necessarily amazing. They're, they're often quite quirky instruments. They don't necessarily sound a whole lot better than a new instrument, but they're very special. And so there's, there's just lots of stuff in the world that that has a value because it has a value and and it, the longer the history of a thing having a value the the more likely it is to hold up it it would seem yeah yeah no i mean um I, i'm i'm just going to see if i actually have them here but for me the it, it all clicked when someone you know was talking about nfts uh, yeah and they compared it to like uh pokemon cards i'm not sure if you can actually see this but yeah. um also, like, I just had a couple of old ones lying around from my youth. But then, you know, people told me like, oh, this card um, is in good condition. It came out like, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's actually in Dutch. So the language is in Dutch. And then the value is like much less. But for sort of all, most practical purposes, that doesn't matter, right? And even more silly, they have like, uh, I think this actually, edition stamp or something. I would, have thought it, I would have thought that adds a rarity value to it. But I guess not, you know. Yeah, but I guess most collectors are are in, in the US, American, UK, yeah. and uh, yeah, exactly. So that that sort of and especially like the um, they have like a little um, sort of first edition or something like that, and and that you know someone explained to me it was like yeah, but that card, the first edition, is obviously worth more than uh, the non first edition, and that, and I was like yeah, yeah, I agree, that makes intuitive sense. And so that they tied that to NFT saying like, hey, this your unique NFT, of course, the card, right? The card and the, the, pay, the picture and you know, using it in a Pokemon game is the same value, but still yeah. it's worth more. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, well, it, actually, it's just sort of what the things that attain value, it, it's a fascinating thing because even to a certain extent, it, it relies on one really convincing person out there who's able to tell, like, there must be, like, I, to be honest, I have no idea why anyone cares about Pokemon. It's similar to stamps, like, I just don't get it. But there must once in a while be some really influential person, like the, the Kim Kardashian of stamp collecting, that convinced all of these other people that it's a worthwhile hobby and that certain ones are worth millions of dollars, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then that's hell, so... Yeah, and and just to, to to be clear, I think still I think most NFTs are practically practically worthless, and most of their value came from people thinking the value would go up, right? And I think yeah. that's also uh, the case. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. Like, there's even there was a very funny video I saw a while ago where like an art critic looked at the you know the various valuable NFTs, 
And, uh, you know, they, they even pointed out like the fact that I guess they come in editions of 10,000, which doesn't strike me as unusually rare either, just to be clear. You know, they come in editions of 10,000 and it would be a lot of work to churn out 10,000 different monkey drawings. And so, of course, they use templates and they'll just sort of throw a scarf on uh, 10% of them and throw, a, you know, a cigar in the mouth of another X percent or whatever. But when when you look at the overall collections, they're a rather incoherent, like no no actual artist would come up with sort of such such incoherent images because they would have put more work into something <laughs> that they expected to have value. So yeah. So um and uh, yeah, just tying it all back to sort of the intrinsic value for Bitcoin, because I think that was um what sparked this uh, small um you know, me showing off my uh, shiny Dragonite, uh, which the plain bagel actually is very jealous of. Uh, he told uh, he told us in the chat. But um, I think the value of Bitcoin. I thought that was interesting when it when it first came out. You know, I I was doing a finance master at the time, and I tried to sort of. I think a lot of people at the time tried to apply the discounted cash flow method to it, and uh, that that doesn't work at all because there are no cash flows. But you can, I think there is some inherent value from its uh, currency usage, which is sometimes used, especially in emerging markets. But, you know, most of it, I think, just like with NFTs, are get value because people expect it to go up, because it, people expect someone else to pay more for it, right? And that's well, a very it, volatile. Even I, I think there's other fascinating ideas in there, like if, if we even look into kind of some of the fintech and uh, Web3 ideas, where... These things are pitched on sort of two angles. One idea is that these things are better because there's no middleman, right? Like the, the whole idea is that, you know, you can all... Because in a way, I, when, when Bitcoin first came out, I almost thought that it would be like PayPal. I didn't really understand it. And I thought, well, actually, it would be nice to have a, a good way of transacting online. Yeah. And PayPal was supposed to be that, but the fees were always so high. Like, I don't, if you've ever used PayPal, I don't know what happens, but you never seem to get as much money out of it as, as goes in. As I'm um, always disappointed when I have a sponsor that wants to pay me in, in PayPal. Yeah, like, it, uh, like I, it's amazing how high the trends are. I don't even know what they are, but they seem to be unusually high. But, uh, and also there's all sorts of, I, I don't know, the, it doesn't seem like a great system to me. But then, and so I initially thought that maybe a, a Bitcoin would be sort of a, a form of PayPal without the high fees, which of course would have been an interesting concept. But when we look at a lot of the, the crypto space, on one hand, they pitch to you as a user that will say, for example, that you'll be able to exchange currencies at, at almost no cost, which seems like a great thing. Uh, but then they kind of tell you that if you sort of see these smart contracts or whatever, you know, these DeFi protocols that will do the transactions, that you'll make a lot of money. And it's like, well, if someone's making a lot of money, yeah. you know, the money's not coming from nowhere, right? So they're and if the, if they're making more money than a bank makes on foreign exchange, the fees must be higher than they are on foreign. So one of the two parties is being lied to, either the person who feels they're transacting at no cost or the person who's invested in a protocol and is supposed to be earning a high rate of return who possibly won't get it. And I feel there's lots of, you know, the even the idea, a lot of the Web3 ideas around getting there's a very funny um video clip that someone uh, tweeted a while ago I, th I think i retweeted it where it was mark andreessen speaking to uh, a podcaster and mark andreessen was talking about the wonders of web3 and how they'll allow all of this monetization and the guy kind of said well i've got a podcast and it's monetized and i'm doing all right out of it like how will web3 improve this and Mark Andreessen talked in circles and circles, and he couldn't come to like one possible advantage of this sort of microtransaction, like a way that would monetize it better than just sort of turning on monetization in YouTube does for uh, people like you and I. Mm -hmm. And there, there's kind of this idea out there that's been pitched to people. Like, I, I guess we're being told that people like Facebook are sort of taking our data 
and monetizing it. And, and that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is getting hugely wealthy out of my data. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that my data on its own is worth nothing, right? Like data, data like that is only valuable when you have all of it, you know, like when you when you have a large aggregate of uh, when, when you're able to see what human society is doing rather than what Patrick is doing. Yeah. And people are being told with Web3 that, you know, instead of there being a Facebook, you'll have your own version of this that's somehow hosted by someone who doesn't seem to be getting paid to host it and that you'll get to monetize, like we'll say, every time someone looks at your LinkedIn profile or looks at your uh, Facebook page or whatever it might be. And it, it strikes me as a very complicated version of the world where I, I don't really see people making much money out of it. Like I wouldn't bet on, I, I wouldn't want to have to live off of the, the income some I could make out of hosting my own personal Facebook page, you know? And I think that it, there's even, uh, I had a very interesting conversation with, and now I can't remember his name, but oh gosh, I can't think of it. Quincy Larson. I don't know if you've heard of him. He has... No. um. It's called a free code camp. He basically teaches people how to code mm. for free on, mm -hmm. on uh, the internet. And it, it's a great thing. But I had a conversation with him a while ago because he's very much from that early internet point of view, the, the information wants to be free idea. Yeah. And I find it interesting that I, in many ways, like the internet has hugely improved. But I would also argue that there's sort of become less and less sort of free data on the internet compared to in the late 90s when I first started out. Like, for example, back then, you were able to, like Yahoo or MSN, there were tons of, you know, companies that just put all of the stock market data for free up on the internet. You could just download it and do all of these studies and whatever. And that's actually how I started my career, was just downloading data from the internet, analyzing it and finding investment opportunities. And I, I sort of look at the world today and think that a version, a, a young version of me would sit down at their computer and it would just be paywall after paywall, even things like academic papers all hidden behind paywalls. And I don't know, there's uh, every news article hidden behind paywalls. And I, I slightly worry that the Web3 version of the internet is just one huge paywall for, for just everything. And, and that doesn't strike me as, a, as an improvement. But I, I mm. might be wrong. I might misinterpret their vision. But. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I, I can fake an intelligent comment about this, but uh, I, I don't know too much about uh, Web3.0. But, um, you know, to, to follow on your sort of this bleak outlook, I think it's time to talk about emerging markets okay. uh, in the sense that, um, yeah, I mean, I've noticed that also with the videos you make, I think you now just made one about um, the international uh, China debt crisis uh, that seems yeah. to be uh, garnering a lot of interest. Uh, I also know that you are working on research for uh, the, the case of Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah, and, I, um, I probably will have a video up on Thursday or Friday on that topic. So, so shall we talk about uh, the trend first? Like, I think you know this is something I talked about in my Sri Lanka video that um, the China story is related to this this trouble in emerging markets, but I don't think it's the full story. But there definitely seems to be like a ma a turning point, right? So much stress, like. Uh, Sri Lanka is uh, obviously uh, now crashing, but uh, Afghanistan uh, probably has already crashed, but yeah. the world has lost a little bit of interest in that story, it seemed. Uh, also, there's not a lot of data out, I guess. But there's much more like Lebanon, Tunisia, um, uh, Ghana, I think, uh, Ghana, is in trouble, Zambia. Zambia. Yeah. Bangladesh, yeah. No, there's, I, it's sort of a fascinating thing because there is a lot of stress in emerging markets and it's not a single factor thing kind of like you, your video on sri lanka summed it up awfully well because there were four to five different uh forces all applied at once to sri lanka that that caused this uh this collapse and when you look at other emerging market countries 
they're all coming under pressure, but often different pressures. Like they're you you can't like if you look at Ghana, the the problems they have are quite different to Sri Lanka. They are, they all are getting squeezed by certain big uh, geopolitical things, like the the strong dollar and inflation in the U.S. isn't. You know, it's almost a bit like a taper tantrum 2.0 kind of mm-hmm. a feeling. Mm-hmm. But you've got, uh, you know, and, and you've got kind of food inflation possibly coming from uh, the Ukraine situation. Just uh, th- there are a lot of problems kind of squeezing in on many of the emerging markets right now. And yeah, it's it, it's a fascinating, it, it's funny, I, I made my video about China, but basically what's interesting to me is that China, you know, in I think it was 2013, sort of started with this Belt and Road Initiative, the idea being to, uh, you know, sort of build out a trade infrastructure, kind of a, a new silk road around the world. And they made an awful lot of loans. And many of those loans are not looking so good because they're too. Uh, th- these are loans to to countries that are looking quite shaky at the moment, and and in many ways, it, depending on the country, there appears to have been a lot of malinvestment associated with that. Um, you know, for example, like cricket stadiums in uh, in Sri Lanka, and you know, mm. versions of that all over the world that that weren't needed in uh, in an emerging market, but. I find it interesting. I guess I, I put up the video about China and the, the issues around the Belt and Road Initiative. And I was a little bit surprised that I got a certain number of angry comments where people said to me, why are you criticizing China? And I thought, well, I'm not criticizing China. I'm saying that they made a bunch of loans to people who at the moment are struggling to pay back those loans. But it's interesting that there's a a certain segment that viewed that as a, a an accusation of wrongdoing, you know, to uh, frankly either side of that transaction, you know. But yeah, yeah it yeah. it, it yeah. would appear that there there just is an awful lot of stress in emerging markets, and and not driven by one simple factor. It's it's driven by an awful lot of what's happening in kind of global politics, global economics. Um, you know, just just even fund flows like, you know, I, I read the other day, you know, about the huge outflows that have occurred uh, from, from emerging markets. Like, And it's just investors who will say put their money in an EM uh, index fund and have decided they've had enough and are pulling out. But of course, that then impacts people in those countries. So. Yeah, you know, I had the same thing with my Sri Lanka video. So I tried to sort of uh, summarize the four main narratives and give sort of pros and cons, but uh, the overwhelming amount of comments, you know, about being negative about one of these narratives was, what, uh, China, uh, only 10% of the debt, uh, you are a Western propaganda machine. And uh, it got me wondering uh, that, uh, you know, the even small channels like uh, like ours are comparatively small, are, are perhaps targeted by um, state actors uh, who are, are commenting uh, which well, is, it is quite unusual flattering, because, right? Because I, I have watched mm. your video, and mm. my takeaway from your video was that you said there were four main factors that caused problems. I, I think you kind of possibly weighted most heavily towards corruption in the country, but you did not say this is what happened. You said the, these are the factors. I'll allow you to tell me in the comments section what you think the issue is. So you, you by no means blamed <laughs> any of the four factors. Uh, you, you simply put forth that there are uh, events uh, occurring that conspired to, to bring about this crisis. But yeah, I, I even wonder if, uh, you know, the angriest comments, if they've even watched the video, because it, it doesn't uh, fully make sense, <laughs> some of what they have to say. But yeah, yeah, perhaps. Although I, I mean, in in their defense, uh, there is of course some power in uh, in choosing the narratives. So I did come also across um, narratives that I thought were ridiculous, and so I didn't present them. So I, I guess by presenting China as one of those narratives, I I do signal that I think it's um, it's not complete bullshit. Oh, if I yeah, I was just thinking well, if I need to beat well, myself on, on the stream. One of the things that's interesting, like the reason that that China as a big lender to Sri Lanka, the reason it's interesting is that we have more of a history. There's about a 70-year history of 
kind of how uh, the the Paris Club deals with um, uh, emerging market restructures, like like basically when loans go wrong, which they they do from time to time. There, there's a framework by which usually all of the the countries that are owed money negotiate with the the borrower to to get paid like whatever concessions are made they're made by all of the lenders together rather than on a one by one basis where different deals are negotiated and what's in the thing that's interesting about china as a lender to sri lanka because as you say it's 10% of the overall debt but but china doesn't tend to join in in those group negotiations they tend to negotiate their own deal um you know which which is you know of course reasonable for them to do, but that then just leads to curiosity as to how that will work. And it also, it means that other lenders to Sri Lanka kind of want to see how that goes. Because, for example, uh, the IMF doesn't want to give money to Sri Lanka that will instantly just be handed over to China, right? Like they're not going to negotiate a bailout that, that just hands money to another creditor nation so that's that's kind of what's interesting about um uh, about the current situation in sri lanka and and once again there's no judgments in there there's no uh, there's no claim that there's a there, there's a a high and moral uh, country versus a, an evil country it's it's that there's different ways of doing things and it's interesting to see how things will work out when these two opposing approaches uh, kind of collide within uh, a restructuring in Sri Lanka. So, Yeah, and now sort of related to that, I, I saw someone in the chat also mentioning this. Um, it seems that China itself is slowing down again, right? And this was something you talked about extensively, I think, uh, roughly last year. Do you think it's now coming to a, a critical point there? Well, there are there are big problems with China in that, you know, that there, there is a, an excess of leverage within the country, uh, largely tied to the real estate bubble, you know, and by that, I just, once again, there's no judgment in here, but the average Chinese person has really only one investment uh, opportunity, which is real estate within China. And that became a huge bubble. And in a country where, you know, up, uh, what, 30 years ago, you were not allowed to own real estate. So when people own real estate, they make money on it. And then everyone decides the best thing to do is to own real estate. And you have this, this bubble form. But you then end up in a situation where real estate relative to incomes in China is probably the most expensive in the world. And entire families pool their money in order to buy a home that is sort of supposed to be a a generator of wealth or a retirement plan. It's very problematic for the country if that bubble, both for the individuals and for the country, if that bubble bursts. The the problem is that this bubble has been inflating. You know, at first, the, the increases in real estate value in China made sense. But probably for the last 20 years, uh, it's been an inflating bubble. And politicians have sort of chosen to kick it down the road, which is what politicians in every part of the world do. No one wants a crisis to occur on their watch. But right now, you know, with Evergrande and everything else, the three red lines and so on, we are seeing the, the air coming out of the real estate bubble in China. Yeah, and then, and, but but you do see you some, also, somewhat of a um, an interesting thing there, though that that they recognized it quite early on, no, and then they seem to do something about it, but then they always seem to pull back again when it well, when it gets do. too far. And and this is just the nature of politicians. Always, you know, you sort of have to stay in power, and you want to, you know things to look good when when you were in charge. And so, in many ways, like I, you know, I'm I'm not a huge fan of Xi. In fact, I think uh, you know, I think he's sort of trying to move China back to that sort of Maoist uh, country. Like, I I don't agree with a lot of what he's doing, but he is, at some point, a day of reckoning kind of has to come whenever there's a bubble. And in a way, what he's done is force it to be now rather than in five years' time when it's inflated even further. 
And so it's almost back to our discussion of the financial crisis or whatever, that once in a while pain has to occur. You know, there are gains and losses and we can pretend to not have any losses for a long time. But at a, at a certain point, the, the chickens come home to roost. And so China does have that problem. They equally have this issue, you know, the zero COVID policy that they've been pursuing. Uh, at first, it was thought that they were just doing this in the lead up to the Olympics, you know, that they kind of wanted to to sort of do this uh, for, for a short mm, while. Yeah. But now it sort of seems like an endless uh, lockdown, which, you know, has to be hugely economically harmful, like to to shut down all sorts of businesses and factories and everything in the country. And then you have this issue of emerging markets that they've lent money to being unable to repay them. And so, you know, there, there are, China is experiencing a lot of difficulties. And there, there's even that, uh, you know, actually, I, I, I saw uh, you on Twitter retweeted a, a very good post uh, from Michael Pettis, maybe yeah. about a week ago, on the comparison between China and Japan. And basically, you know, there, there's kind of this, uh, what do they call it? Like the middle, middle income, um, trap. Middle income uh, trap. gap, yeah, where, where countries throughout mm. economic history struggle to move from that sort of high growth, uh, sort of world's factory economy into a mature economy and it's almost it's it's kind of the problem of emerging markets is that they're always emerging and it's very rare that you see one emerge you know like there's probably uh, two examples of emerging markets that emerged were probably korea south korea and the united states you know and other than that the others just emerge and emerge but kind of constantly collapse when uh, when they get to to this turning point because it's very difficult you know to flip from one type of economy into another yeah no that that is definitely very difficult maybe we could add uh, taiwan and uh, and singapore to to that list uh, but um, i think it's very inflammatory for you to refer to uh, oh, taiwan yes. what, what did i say no. No, next thing you'll be, next thing you'll be going there on a visit. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Oh my goodness, Patrick. Yeah, we we maybe we can censor that out in in any sort of way, but uh, let's not uh, let's not rinse words. So let me ask you this question then, because um, this is something you know. You're a professional investor, and I think also a lot of people who watch you are investors. And emerging market economies are very. Uh, interesting and fascinating from an economist perspective. But why do you, do you as an investor care about this stuff? To be honest, I don't really invest in emerging markets. Um, I have friends who do, so I have a lot of conversations about them uh, and so on. In fact, it, it's a slightly interesting thing where it's kind of better for me to talk about topics about like this that I find interesting and don't really have a dog in the fight of because I think almost the the problem with discussing this stuff too much on YouTube is that, um, you know, if, if you actually did invest in these things, you, you might have an urge to sort of, you know, what can I say, like kind of pump your own investment. So I tend to, a lot of the things like when I speak about specific companies and whatever, they tend to be companies that I have no position in simply because otherwise it's sort of... Um, uh, filled with the, uh, uh, it's a minefield in terms of ethical behavior, you know, so. Yeah. And and one thing that I, I wonder about that is that relates to sort of stock investing, where um, investing in, in a uh, bad company might still be a good investment. I, that's also something like when people talk to me about investing in emerging markets that, that I always try to at least remind them of in the sense that you, that, that makes it super difficult, right? Because I can tell a story about how the Pakistan Pakistan's economy is is not well run, but it might still be an excellent investment uh, because it's underpriced. Yeah, no, well, that that's kind of the interesting thing because even I, I think a place that a lot of beginner investors fall down is that they think the idea is to find great companies, like the idea of find stuff that you really like, you know, if you like the product, you, you know, it's a good investment. But of course, the, the question always is to what extent 
uh, that's already uh, encapsulated in the price. And so often, e- even a lot of the concept of like value investors, you know, they'll find themselves investing in businesses that aren't necessarily the most exciting business in the world, but it, it, it's priced appropriately. There was, I, I think, you know, Warren Buffett uh, has sort of talked about this idea of, I think it was kind of Ben Graham's idea, he called it cigar butt investing, that, uh, you know, the idea being, that if you find a cigar butt on the sidewalk, you know, it may it may seem like an unattractive thing, but the truth is there's probably a few puffs left in it, like there's some value left in that thing. And so it doesn't, you know, investing, like putting your money into something is usually done because the, the security is mispriced rather than, you know, it doesn't matter if you like the product or not. It relates to whether... Uh, you know, kind of what the probability of of excess returns are. Yeah. And um, Patrick, uh, then I also saw a question and maybe we can move to to some questions about uh, the emerging market uh, crisis uh, crisis after that. But I I was wondering sort of which which countries are on your radar? Like you you obviously talked about Sri Lanka, but um, after that, you know, are, are there already some countries on your radar that you find specifically interesting that are not in the news cycle quite yet? moment not not on a not on a grand scale like uh, you know i i'm looking at the moment i find it interesting a lot you know if you just look at uh, bond yields you can kind of see which uh, you know which countries as you mentioned earlier places like ghana places like uh, el salvador uh, you know um places like ukraine you know where where there's obviously extreme uh, distress in in those markets and so you you can look around the world and see a lot of emerging markets struggle right now. It's even can come down to to what extent they import things like fuel and and food, uh, because these are the things that are exploding in price. Yeah, and that that does seem to be a uh, like if we wanna because we haven't really looked for patterns I think yet in this uh, phenomena. Right, we've mentioned how a lot of countries are in trouble. We've we've related it to the China Belt and Road Initiative for some countries, maybe to the dollar or global financial cycle with uh, dollar interest rates uh, going up for others and and corruption for yet again others. Uh, but I, what I find interesting about this, uh, about it so far, is that we've really again seen the importance of uh, running trade surpluses. Um, and I think that that's especially like like the ones that that didn't have that at all, like Sri Lanka, Lebanon were the first to fall, Pakistan. And on the other hand, Russia, uh, was actually able to uh, withstand sanctions surprisingly well, at least for now, at least the financial sanctions, I think, yeah. thanks to that trade surplus. Well, it's an interesting thing because I, I think the biggest story in the world right now is energy. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, there, there was almost this idea in 2020 during the COVID lockdowns, you know, where we saw uh, a real reduction in the amount of energy used. I, I think there was almost this idea that the, there'd been a huge success associated with the uh, environmental revolution and that everything would move to, you know, sort of solar cells and uh, wind turbines. And suddenly we're seeing the extent to which the world really, really, like almost global poverty actually is heavily tied to just the availability of energy you know like th- things like people don't realize that fertilizer like nitrogen fertilizer is just a function of natural gas you know like it, it the nitrogen comes from the air but we mm. use a huge amount of uh, methane or natural gas to make it you know people uh, you know how businesses run how uh, ev- everything all of our costs like if the cost of our food the cost of imports, all of these things are tied to the cost of energy. And the world is right now realizing um, kind of how reliant we are on, you know, fossil fuels, d- despite the fact that people don't want to be reliant on them. And that is kind of the almost the, the question of our times is kind of how, how the world will deal with this. Yeah. So that, that actually reminds me, like, uh, this is something that's especially uh, a hot topic uh, in, in Europe. Uh, like, 
and if I can relate it to the market, uh, the emerging market crisis, so sort of there you had like the dollar tide is receding and now you can see who was swimming naked, you know, that expression. Uh, yeah. We might actually observe something similar with uh, the energy crisis, like for example, you know, with a huge increases in, in energy prices, we can now see that Germany uh, is now under fire, at least in uh, in Europe specifically, that they were energy-wise living beyond beyond their means or swimming naked, whereas France is weathering the storm much better uh, because they, they still had all of their nuclear reactors. Yeah, well, when energy was cheap, it seemed to, to not matter, you know, and uh, then all of a sudden, um, you know, wh- when it becomes scarce, when it becomes expensive, suddenly it matters a lot. And the German situation is kind of a wild one. Like, I think they even still plan, like they have three remaining nuclear reactors that they plan on shutting down in in December that that's kind of a, a bit a bit of a wild thing and and even a lot of the transitions you know it well it's even there's sometimes uh, what can I say like just sort of big lies out there like they you know a country can claim you know if we shut off uh we'll say for example natural gas extraction in our country that we've done something green but that's not really the case if you're just piping it in from another country or replacing it with, you know, coal driven energy from another country or something like that. And it's something I find a little bit fascinating, even in the overall ESG world. You know, there was a, a year or two ago, BP was making a lot of noise about divesting fossil fuel assets. And they basically said, um, you know, we're going to sell off all of these uh, extra. These uh, we'll call them oil rigs, and uh, and that that will make us a green company. And it's like, well, it only really is green if you continue to own them and close them down. Do you know what I mean? But if you if you BP uh, a responsible company sell uh, uh, an oil rig uh, to to an irresponsible, badly financed company, that's bad for the environment because the same amount of oil comes out of the ground, but it's done in a much messier, less responsible way. And so to a certain extent, there's there's possibly a lot of skirting responsibility that's gone on where people can claim to be green by, uh, you know, sort of not touching the dirty thing themselves, but but by still being a big consumer of it. Yeah, yeah. And what ESDE uh, stands for environmental? Environmental, social and governance. Oh yeah, and and that's basically like for the people. I'm not sure if everybody uh, knows this. Uh, sort of an um, a new uh, hot uh, investment it's like a label, a right? Topic. Yeah, it's it's been a way of telling people. It, the the overall concept has been around for a long time, but it's kind of become particularly hot, where you get to tell people that they can invest in, we'll say, an index fund or something like that. But all of the kind of irresponsible or bad companies or the environmentally harmful or the immoral companies are removed from the index. So there won't be sort of oil, tobacco, um, firearms, things like that in your investment portfolio. And, And that appeals to people, particularly when they're told that the return will, not only will they get to be a better person, but the return will be higher. And and now a lot of that is coming under question. And and even people are asking, are the things that are being labeled as ESG or environment, are they actually good for the planet, good for the world, or is it just a, a marketing trick? And that's kind of a a question a lot of people are asking right now. Yeah. Yeah. And on the reverse, I I, I also saw someone commenting in the chat that uh it's also, um, it can also be seen the other way around, right? Like that um, we should be wary that we're not now imposing that emerging markets first uh, get off the dirty fuels because they may really need it in their development and that we do it sort of a little bit later because we're already fairly green. I, I know we're not, but do you see? Well, uh, well I, I, I think that is a thing that is happening in that if you look at sort of CO2 output from the developed world, it kind of flatlined slash reduced maybe even 20 years ago. I haven't looked at the charts in a while, so I'd have to look this up again. But of course, global CO2 output has hugely increased just because of 
of global development. You know, as people get wealthier, they tend to consume more and any sort of consumption uh, equates to, you know, greater energy usage. And uh, yeah, and and then I, I think that in the Western world, there is an awareness that maybe it might be wrong to sort of, uh, I don't know, tell someone in Africa that they have to run their hospital on a solar cell while we get to run ours on a, you know, a, a stable electrical grid. Uh, but, you know, these are all, uh, you know, the, these are all problems that uh, I, I guess people are trying to solve right now and trying to come up with reasonable solutions to. But there's always problems associated with implementing anything new. Yeah. And so I think with that, uh, we've been talking for a long time already. Uh, it's time to uh, to maybe grab a, a bit of a coffee to uh, and also, I'm getting some uh, very subtle signals that uh, my wife wants to use uh, the same room as a yoga studio in a, in a couple of minutes. But um, let's say it's uh, it's all about uh, the intellectually heavy conversation that we've uh, we've been having that has exhausted me, uh, Patrick. We've talked about the financial market, efficient financial market hypothesis, crypto markets, and their relation to to money, and then also emerging market crisis. So a fairly heavy on the uh, academic side, uh, perhaps, uh, and economic side discussion, uh, which I'm really happy with uh, because we're on the Money and Macro channel. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, and what I will do is I will uh, edit these, uh, this conversation into a nicer format, add some subtitles, uh, and also make it into a couple of clips and post them on my second channel, Money and Macro Talks. Uh, is there something that you uh, you want to close off this conversation with? Uh, Patrick, maybe say, say something to the uh, Money and Macro viewers to get them over to your channel if they are not already there, which would surprise me. Well, actually, it, it is funny, as you mentioned, I see in my YouTube analytics sort of huge overlap between our channels. I think we, we have a lot of viewers in common and I'd just like to thank everyone for tuning in and hopefully you guys found uh, the conversations that are interesting. Excellent. So with that, uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining. I'm sure Patrick and uh, myself will, uh, will speak again at some time. So I also saw the plain bagel in the chat, who I'm sure will also talk to um, again at some point. 